Hey guys, Vlad here with AVT Astro. And as you could clearly see, today we are talking about astrophysics, achromatic refractors. For those of you that might not be familiar, I run a little astro blog called avt-astro.com. And of course this YouTube channel, so if you're not subscribed, please do consider subscribing. Over the years, I've had the privilege of owning over a hundred scopes and more accessories than I could count. All right, guys, so let's get down to the topic of the video. You know, why is the title of the video say that these are the most desirable refractors in the world, right? You're like, you know, did astrophysics call that? And they're like, you know, we're having, you know, some inventory issues. We've got, you know, the warehouses are piling up with these scopes. We've got to move them. Let's give Vlad on the phone. Let's send a couple of these to him. Um, yeah, sadly, no. <laughs> So I had the privilege, uh, for those of you guys that watched my channel, I had the privilege of actually finding the Astrophysics 130 GT from a gent locally here. Uh, he was actually a member of our astronomy club, the Rose City Astronomers. He was kind of getting out of the hobby. Um, and uh, he used this thing for astrophotography. Um, so yeah, I was able to pick this thing up. I mean, this is, you know, one of these has been a long time dream of mine. Okay. So now that kind of brings us, you know, kind of more to more to the present. Uh, about uh, a couple of months ago, I had the privilege of picking up the Starfire 152, also locally. So I mean, the stars have really been aligning for me lately with astrophysics refractors. Okay, um, and now you might be like wondering, you're like, okay, well, like, hold on a second. So you said that you've owned over 100 scopes and you just recently picked them up. Like, what's the deal? Like, what's the big deal? Why, why are you saying that you're so lucky? Well, um, you know, you might be one of those people that has like a truck full of money sitting there and you think that you're ultra cool, which maybe you do, and maybe you are ultra cool. And you're like, I'll just call astrophysics right now, right? And be like, hey, you know, like send me, you know, a couple of these. I want to, you know, see what, you know, what all the hype's about, right? Um, well, um, the, the sad truth is that uh, they used to have a waiting period of about seven years to get one of these, right? And the waiting period got so long to where they locked the waiting list. So you can't even add yourself onto the list anymore. So I try to be pretty positive on my channel usually, but, and you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you want to pick up one of these, you know, you're essentially out of luck, you know, as, as far as buying a new, I mean, you know, your you know, best chance is find a used one. So I you know that's why I kind of have the privilege, you know, of owning these two guys right now. Um, I'm looking, you know, I've obviously ever used this one on, you know, quite a bit. Actually, interesting enough, this kind of an aside, I bought this thing, right, in November, in the Northwest, we had like two weeks of clear weather. As you kind of see, you know, the image got a lot brighter right now because the sun kind of came out, you know, today's kind of a clear day too. Amazing, right? But anyway, that's the side. So let's kind of get into, you know, like a little bit of the history of the brand and kind of, you know, talk about what got them to where they are. And that's, that's what kind of inspired me to make this video right now is that I have an early example of one of their scopes and a more recent example of one of them. All right, so the guy that started it all, his name is Roland Christian. He started astrophysics in about 19, in the 1970s. Uh, he did not start by making beautiful apromatic refractors. He actually started by making drive correctors. Um, I got most of this info from an article on Company 7's website. So please check them out. I want to give credit where it's due. Um, the, the article doesn't really mention this, but I have this from a personal example. So they actually even like bought like Japanese, this is a Japanese PLOS, right? That's branded with the astrophysics theme in their early days. So they kind of did a couple of different things. But again, you know, reselling eyepieces that somebody else makes doesn't make you legendary, right? And doesn't give you like an infinite wait period for your products. What made them legendary is that um, back in 1986, Roland started making these triplet, you know, apromatic refractors. And prior to that, most of the, you know, telescopes that are refractors, they were made with two lenses, which does not give you a color-free image. I'll post an image of what secondary color looks like. It's just essentially purple around bright stars usually, but it can be on planets and the moon as well, pretty much any bright object. Um, so he started making a telescope with three lenses instead of two. What that gave him the ability to do 
I mean, besides being an optical, you know, genius, but what gave, what what gave, what that gave him the ability to do is to essentially make a uh, color-free achromatic telescope. And achromatic means that it's basically secondary color-free, essentially. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. Um, so this is one of the examples of the pre-ED, pre, you know, new. Um, extra low dispersion glass that's used in a lot of the newer achromatic telescopes. I've read about these scopes before. Um, they're called an achromat, right? Uh, the front lens says it, you know, so on it. I always figure, I was like, man, it doesn't have any exotic glass in it, right? There's no way that this thing is going to be even nearly color free. Well, I was wrong. I had this thing out, um, you know, again, like observing for a couple of weeks, actually pretty solidly of Jupiter and Saturn. This thing is absolutely color free on Jupiter and Saturn up to like 250X. On Vega, you do see a little bit of secondary color around 200X or so. Pretty typical, most even modern achromats will show a little bit of secondary color on Vega, especially, you know, as the pyros increase. I'd say overall, you know, color correction on this is equivalent to uh, the Takahashi FS128 that I had, which is a uh, fluoride doublet. Fluoride is the best glass that you can have. Now, there is a doublet telescope, this is a triplet. About the same color correction. Now, of course, you know, color correction is only one, you know, one aspect of the overall performance of an achromatic telescope, right? There are several things that kind of contributed to this then becoming of legendary status. So basically, like, what do I mean by that? Sticking with the optics still, Roland was able to make optics. Uh, first of all, the whole design of them was, you know, like I said, he's an optical genius. Uh, so the whole design of them is designed to work very well together. Um, essentially, there's a couple of things that constitute to the overall performance of the scope. Uh, first of all, the whole optical design constitutes, you know, a lot to the sharpness of the image. Uh, the second thing too is the, the amount of polishing that goes into the images determines how good the contrast is going to be. Essentially, the finer the surfaces are on all of the lenses, the less scatter of light there is going to be and the more contrast to the images are going to be. So from an early, uh, you know, point, he kind of, you know, essentially made it a point to make these the best that he can. Now kind of expanding and you know, sticking with the lens uh, type of, you know, stuff. Uh, so astrophysics from about 1986 to about 1992, I believe, they made uh, lenses that were not uh, ED lenses. Although their first uh, um, scope they used in the ED lens was the Starfire uh, F7 6 inch. So that's a little bit shorter version of this. But it's a 6 inch telescope as well that was made in uh, 1989. And again, ED is just a um, better glass that can give you better color correction. The better color correction, it is important for visual. It's a lot more important for astrophotography, especially with the newer CMOS cameras because they're really sensitive to that. So these older scopes, you know, honestly, again, I was pretty shocked at how, how color free this thing is even, you know, without um, ED glass. Uh, that is using it more for visual use, which, you know, this long of a focal length of instrument, it's kind of more of a visual planetary type of telescope. All right, so all astrophysics telescopes are manufactured and designed in Illinois. Uh, basically, they use the absolute best glass possible. Um, and the other thing that separates these and gives them just, you know, that extra little oomph, you know, as far as, you know, optical performance is that uh, compared to a mass-produced scope, which mass-produced scopes these days are actually really good, uh, but these lenses are, you know, like initially kind of formed the same way that the mass-produced scopes are, but later on in the manufacture process, there is an actual human that gets involved. You know, he looks at all of the reports for the lenses, does any final figuring, polishing that needs to be done. And that's why every single one of these that leaves the factory is essentially perfectly optically. All right, so kind of, you know, let's go over, you know, we kind of covered this, the, uh, the optics a lot, right? Let's kind of go over the mechanics of the telescope and I'll kind of talk of, you know, a few things about the older models, just in case, you know, you kind of run into one of these or, you know, considering one, and I'll kind of move on to the newer model. Um, okay, 
So with the older models, so these guys, they were painted, right? So this is paint. Uh, the newer models are powder coated. Power coated, power coat is a way more durable finish on the scope. Uh, so beautiful finish on this. Uh, it is a lot more likely to get scratched and chipped on type of deal. Power coat is a lot more durable. So that's one, you know, difference there. Uh, they used to, you know, I can't reach that far. That's how long the scope is. <laughs> they used to use a single speed focuser. Uh, that's a 2.7 inch. I think they actually made this scope with like a four inch as well. Still single speed. Uh, very smooth focuser. I mean, it does have some play in this. So not as good as the newer, you know, feather touch units for sure. So that was the difference. Even from an early stage, they are very well baffled. Baffles are basically, you know, uh, like things in here to help the light kind of go wherever it's supposed to go. So very well baffled on these older models. All right, anyway, let me actually kind of set this guy aside and I'll bring this one forward and we'll kind of talk about a few of the mechanical aspects of the newer astrophysics refractors that really kind of separate them from all the other brands. All right, so as the stickers on here says, Astrophysics Starfire 130 EDF. The uh, ED stands for the extra low, low dispersion glass. So this is one of the newer models that does use the newer glass. Um, where to begin with this then? I mean, just generally speaking, you know, like the first time you like, you know, see one of these, you handle one of these. I mean, it's just a total work of art. I mean, everything, like, th there's nothing on here that looks cheap, you know? I mean, everything is just so finely machined. Um, so this is actually a model that was made to be, it's a five inch telescope, right, objective wise. It's made to be airline portable. So you could actually take like this on screws, you could take the focuser off, this on screws, you could take the lens cell off, and you could actually bring this as a carry-on on an airplane. This is the biggest Apple that they make that was airline uh, portable. <laughs> now, all of the machining on this, I mean, it's kind of hard to demonstrate on the video, but um, these are caps that are made to cap like individual components on here, and it comes with a whole set of these to cap basically everything when you're transporting the scope. I mean, even these caps, they're made out of aluminum. I mean, the machining on them is just, I mean, just amazingly smooth. Um, one aspect of, you know, this thing, even though it's made to come apart into three pieces, and this is the previous model to the one that they currently make, the current one just comes apart into two pieces. Um, even with this coming apart into three pieces, when it's all put together, right, and this is all tightened down, like when you pick up the scope, you would never figure that it's a three-piece design. I mean, everything is just so precisely fit, even when it's screwed in, that you, you would never figure that this is not a solid tube. Um, so the, the, <clears throat> the other kind of, you know, big thing that they upgraded is the focusers now use a feather touch pinion on them. So it's just two speed instead of a single speed as on this one. You know, the actual outside of the focuser still looks pretty much the same. Like the finish is really similar in that type of deal. Um, it's definitely smoother nowadays though. Um, everything, again, it's just super precise. Um, I actually forgot to grab a diagonal. It's actually kind of cool. Maybe I'll post in a clip of this, you know, of what it sounds like. When you put the diagonal in and you take it out, it makes this sound. Take a listen. All right, and that's from everything just being so precisely machined. I mean, the, the, the tolerances here are incredibly tight. And you might be like, okay, well, I mean, this isn't a really fine watch. Like, you know, what's the difference? Uh, for visual use, it doesn't make as big of a difference. For astrophotography, you know, you want everything to be as rock solid as possible. That way it'll eliminate any chances for tilt in the you know, whole uh, optical train to where you'll kind of have elongated stars and that type of deal. But even for a visual type of stuff, if you're into, you know, like high detail, high power planetary stuff, you will see a difference. All right, so kind of sticking with astrophotography, this is the actual um, reducer corrector for this scope. This is, you know, one that they specifically make for the 130 GT. I mean, check out the size on the glass of this thing. It's like a three inch glass, man. I mean, pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing, I would say. Um, and again, the, all of the machining work on this, I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, so optical performance wise on this, this is what kind of amazed me. I mean, this scope, uh, it's kind of a, one of the later examples of the pre-ED ones. This one, I believe was made in 1991, 1992 timeframe. 
And the reason I know that is from the serial number and that this is an actual air space instead of an oil space triplet, which is actually one of the best astrophysics that they ever made um, that was pre-ED. Um, anyhow, so the color correction is a little bit better on this, even though this is a faster scope. This is an f6.3. Uh, um, the, the thing that's amazing to me is that the optical, you know, performance as far as contrast, as far as sharpness between these is almost identical. And I mean, this is a scope that was made like 30 years ago. All right, so um, is there any downsides to these scopes? Well, I mean, I, honestly, the biggest downside is that you can't buy one even if you wanted to, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of like the biggest, you know, stated downside, well-known downside to them is that, I mean, they're not cheap. I'd say they're actually pretty reasonably priced for what they are. Um, like the new model of this, I think right now sells for about eight or maybe even nine grand. Uh, so, I mean, for a five-inch telescope, I mean, that's obviously a lot of money. But there's obviously a lot of people that are willing to pay for it because, you know, you can't even order one even if you wanted to. Uh, the only thing that, the other thing that I will kind of say that, you know, to me is kind of disappointing about such a premium scope. is not the scope itself, it really doesn't have anything to do with the actual scope. It's actually their cases. I'm posting a clip right now of what they look like. I mean, you know, I'd say they're all right at best. I mean, there's really nothing special. I mean, they work, but I mean, they kind of look cheap, honestly, to me. I mean, for such a premium, you know, for, for something that's designed to hold such a premium, you know, scope, I, you know, I wish that they used something like, you know, like a good hard, you know, case and that type of deal. All right, guys, so hopefully you guys found this video interesting. Hopefully you enjoyed checking these guys out and, you know, and kind of the video clips and that type of deal. If you guys have any questions, comments, or anything like that, leave them in the thing below. If you're not subscribed, again, please do consider subscribing. See you guys in the next video. Bye.